I hope by now you all have recovered from an initial shock hearing my version of Chopin's famous C major etude, the opening piece of his opus 10. I also hope you enjoyed the incredible beautiful harmonic curtains that occur when you simply give time to these harmonies to develop and to be absorbed fully by our brains and our hearts. The left hand is this tempo sounds almost as an organ pedal now, putting its shoulders under the colored raindrops of the right hand. This etude, however, is remarkable also because it is one of the most illustrious tributes made to another famous composer, a celebrated one in those days, Johann Sebastian Bach. In this episode, I'll show you how exactly this etude is connected to Bach and of course, what kind of new perspective this opens for our fascinating tempo research. So welcome everybody to Authentic Sound. My name is Wim Winters and this channel is all about exploring the music from Bach to Beethoven and beyond, with a single goal to inspire you on your journey as a musician or as a music lover. And one of the absolute most fascinating exercises there are in musical research is connecting different musical periods with each other. Certainly in a case like this, where it is very well known that Frédéric Chopin not only admired the music of Jazz Bach, but played it a lot and had its students play Bach's music often. In his Etude in C major, one of Chopin's most famous works and one of the earliest as well, composed in 1829, Chopin paid his share of tribute to the Leipzig master. What he did was in, in fact rather simple. The beginning motif of Bach's prelude in C of his first book of the well-tempered keyboard gives the listener a simple, pure triad of C major. Still early 18th century, the hands start from a closed position. Bach divides the span of an octave and a third over two hands like this. And by the way, the sound of the piano will be horrible because it's, it's captured to the Schottgen microphone, like this. What did Chopin do with this motif? Basically, he kept the same motif, but instead of distributing it over two hands, the complete motif now becomes part of the performance of one hand. So going from this to this. As in Bach's prelude, Chopin holds on the entire piece to these white arpeggios, as Bach did with his motif. And by doing so, he turned this prelude into an etude that does not, as many seem to believe today, practice finger speed, but focuses on the suppleness of the wrist. Now, let's focus first on the Bach prelude. It's common time, normal notation pattern, à l'ordinaire, as for instance Hotte Terre would say. So no use of faster note values than 16th, the open harmonic structure. So from this perspective, suggesting perhaps more a tempo that is rather an allegro than a tempo ordinario. But if one wants to emphasize more the rather contemplative character of this piece, I could imagine a tempo around the second as well, being the normal tempo ordinario for common time. This is an excerpt of today's still common tempi. I share them from the slowest to the fast. First Helmut Walcha, he has quarter note 60. Then Wanda Landowska on her playled clavichord, or cla harpsichord I should say, quarter note 62. Glenn Gold in his typical way of playing, quarter note 62 as well. Friedrich Gulda on clavichord, quarter note 72 a tempo he has on the piano as well. And then my own performance of this piece is taken in the same tempo of Gulda, also quarter note 72. Gustav Leonard, the greatest harpsichord player perhaps ever lived, is a bit faster, taking this prelude to a real allegro character with quarter note 84. And the oldest recording, that of Bisoni, is showing a tempo that is a bit above that of Leonard, namely quarter note 88. We end by the tempo indication Cerdi gives for this prelude, which is, if one excludes all context, the fastest of all, quarter note 112. He completely falls out of this row of tempi from 60 to 88 for the quarter note, almost doubling the speed of the normal tempo ordinario. Cerdi is an important source, however, for understanding Chopin. 
few months ago, I made an episode on how Chopin played Bach, a video that is among the most viewed on my channel, I'll link it here on the screen, in which the Bach score of one of Chopin's pupils stood central. In that score, Chopin copied in pencil as accurately as one would think only a student would do the additional performance indications from the Bach edition of Karl Czerny. Central point in that video was the fact that Chopin also copied Czerny's metronome marks. Pointing to another video that I made earlier in 2017, one that I need to reshoot soon, in which we talked about the Czerny tempo marks for the Bach inventions and the rather hilarious results one gets when read in our modern way, unplayable even in many cases, it opens an incredibly important window on the understanding of these tempi indications by simply knowing that at least for Chopin they formed no problem at all. Czerny gave hundreds if not thousands of metronome marks and those tempi were not a joke to him. He points several times to the importance of the metronome and the accuracy of these tempi. So his work, not only the addition of the Bach inventions but also his own etudes, take for instance his famous Opus 299, gives no other solution than to accept the fact that Czerny applied the metrical use of his metronome in which every tick represents only a part of the intended time, as the Melzel 1816 instruction describe, and not the complete time, being the note value used in the metronome equation. So in case of Opus 299, half note 108 means that every tick correlates with the quarter note, part of the intended time, not the half note. The etudes and the inventions by Czerny are the most clear examples to demonstrate this. In the well-tempered clavier, more metronome marks are technically possible, even in single beat. Few are played, however, in single beat. But there is not a single fact or source that would support the thesis that Czerny's well-tempered edition would not be metrical or double beat. If we replace our metronome numbers of our examples by metronome numbers in double beat, so in the old metrical reading, we get an interesting difference. As you can see now, Czerny suddenly is the slowest of all, with a tempo that is close to the normal tempo ordinario for common time. One metronome mark in our list of recordings must have caught the eye of the trained tempo researcher, that of Pisoni. Let's add Chopin's own metronome mark to this and be surprised. Or not. Personally, I believe it's a too fast tempo for this prelude, but apart from that, it does not make any sense. It certainly cannot be proven from any, even basic study on notation to accept the possibility of two pieces written in common time, the Prelude of Bach and the Etude of Chopin, with a similar kind of harmonic openness, similar use of note values, the one clearly inspired by the other to have a tempo relationship of exactly one to two. It touches upon a point I will work out more in detail in a future episode. The generation of late 19th century musicians, as Bisoni was, might have been still aware of echoes of a different historical way of playing, they did not apply it in their own careers. It is clear Bisoni did not ask any questions why playing a Bach Allegro in half the tempo he at least tried to reach in the case of the Chopin etude. But it gives us a beautiful possibility to showcase the unique relationship between the Bach prelude and the Chopin etude. Let me give you a few seconds of Bisoni again and then go to my version of the Chopin etude. It's about the same tempo. Let's listen.
So, hope this little piece of that big puzzle we want to reconstruct opens some ideas and stimulates all of you to do some own research. Make sure to free your mind from any outcome you might be looking for, since it influences the way we read and think a lot. Let me know in the comment sections what your thoughts are, always happy to read them, and if possible, you'll receive a short answer from me as well. In the meantime, I'd like to thank you all for watching and reflecting with me on this fascinating subject. If you want to see more of this, then hit that subscribe button, also the bell icon next to the subscription button, and if you really want to push us all the way to keep going, you might want to become a patron for Authentic Sound and join a group of about 80 other supporters. We have monthly video calls in which we chat about anything, also tempo. Thanks again and see you soon. Bye.